The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. And with the transmitters, we are able to gather data on where the turtles go after they're done nesting for that season. It's important to get the kids out here because if they don't understand the system now, how can we expect them to buy off on protecting and preserving this in the future? My kid came on a field trip and they said they wouldn't leave me alone. We had to come and see what this was about. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. From the Gulf Coast to the mountains of West Texas, biologists have followed to the best of their abilities the habits and lives of Texas wildlife. Now scientists can better pinpoint exactly where wildlife travels by using the newest GPS technology. From 12,000 miles above the Earth, satellites are helping us track wildlife with detail and ease. Each spring, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles come to the Texas shore to perform one of nature's wonders by laying their eggs. Months later, their young hatch and begin their journey through life. Every new hatchling gives hope that this endangered species won't go extinct. The mothers have long since returned to the sea but their exact whereabouts a mystery until now. We're conducting this tracking because we want to get an idea about the habitat usage by these adult females. We want to see uh, where they're going in the marine environment, which is where they spend the vast majority of their life, where they're going for migration, as well as for foraging when they're done nesting. We are affixing satellite transmitters to Kemp's Ridley turtles that nested on the Texas coast two, five, two. so we can follow their migratory pathways and look for any foraging hot spots in the Gulf of Mexico. Once the turtle is in her trance while she's actually laying eggs, we will take a, a swipe sample from her carapace and then we will put her in a transport vehicle and take her a brief ride to the turtle laboratory at Padron National Seashore. We put a little towel over the eyes of the turtle because sometimes it, this helps to calm the turtle. She will have a blood sample that is withdrawn and there will be small biopsy tissue samples taken for use with various studies. We have to sand the shell. We put down the first layer of the epoxy, which is cool as it dries, and then we'll fix the transmitter. Then when it's on there very well and solid, we will paint the surface to help prevent barnacles from adhering onto that area where it has been applied. The whole process takes about three hours. Every time we release a turtle, it is a meaningful experience to us. This is an endangered species. We want to make sure that it's released back on the beach in very healthy and vigorous condition. Many people have been involved in conservation work for Kemp's Ridley turtles. It's a cooperative effort that makes it special. 
and it's one step closer towards hopefully recovering the species someday so that it can be enjoyed by future generations. The public can actually see the tracks for these nesting turtles. They go to www.seaturtle.org and look for the Padron National Seashore Kemp's Relief Tracking Project and then they will see a map for all of the turtles that we're tracking for this year's transmitters deployed and then they will be able to actually click on the links to the specific turtles and see the individual maps. Over 500 miles away in the mountains of West Texas, another species fights to survive. Historically, the native Texas desert bighorn sheep occurred in about 16 mountain ranges. But by the early 1960s, they were gone, mostly due to unregulated hunting and disease. Texas Parks and Wildlife and others have worked to restore the bighorns to their native Texas mountain ranges. But capturing and tracking these elusive animals is challenging in this vast West Texas desert. The way we capture these is, is through a net gun and a helicopter. And what they do is they'll go out and uh, somewhat selectively uh, route them in the direction that they want, and then they fire a net gun on them. They fly up and they bank and they come back and they turn around. And it's almost like a like a fast-paced roller coaster ride. We have sources, uh, in-state sources now that we can go to and capture from and, and, and relocate to other to other mountain ranges. You look up at the mountain and here you see the bubble of the helicopter and then you see the thing attached at the bottom and you know they're sheep. And as they get closer, there they are. Once at the processing station, they're aged. You want to take a picture of the team? Yeah. You take fecal samples. They also take a blood samples. Four plus. Four plus. And those radio collars are, are there to help us monitor the bighorns. GPS, 04, 34. So that's where we get movement and uh, identify other variables such as travel corridors. The restoration effort has been going on for more than 50 years, and you know it's now paying off where we have surplus populations, uh, you know, they're thriving. Wow. <laughs> We're almost halfway there. Our goal is to have all of the 15 or 16 mountain ranges that have critical habitat for them to have a big horns. It wasn't a couple hours ago that they were at Elephant Mountain. Now here they are in their new home. Now they'll be here for, for, for the public to enjoy. And that to me is, is wonderful. Our satellite collars that we have now have really uh, kind of amped up our game as far as technology goes because they allow us to monitor bighorn movements pretty much real time. You can watch them anywhere in the world. And it's pretty fascinating how they move from one place to another. We see that ram, he crosses into Mexico, travels down the mountaintops quite a good ways, at least 25 miles from the release site. The ewes kind of doing their thing, staying, staying around pretty close to the release site within you know, the seven mile radius. Really, really interesting how they move like that. Satellite collars will play a key role in the future. Biologists now learn more about our native and endangered wildlife faster and easier than ever before. And the more we know, the better and smarter we can work to conserve our wildlife for future generations. Hello. Hey. Hey.
There's like five or six of them. Right there, you can kind of see it. On the outskirts of Houston is a special place where a connection to nature can begin and grow. It's an oasis of water and woods amidst the urban landscape. We are surrounded by development. All the way around, we've got industry, we've got urbanization, we've got the skyline of downtown Houston. See, there's a big crawfish chimney out there. But then we've got the park. <laughs> we've got the prairie area, we've got the reservoir, we've got the wooded area of the learning center. What is here is its own little island. Just 15 minutes from downtown, and with more than 2,700 acres of lake, ponds, wetlands, woodlands, and prairie. If we're going to go a half mile. That's it's an opportunity for residents of the state's largest city to explore firsthand the flora and fauna of Texas and lay the foundation for future stewardship of Texas's wild places he was right on the air, right? and wild things. Yeah. You think this is him? You are very correct. And what is this one? Tadpole. It's a tadpole. Okay, what do tadpoles become? Frogs. Frogs. That is so cool. I like alligators. There's an alligator. Where? Over there. You're going to steer it. You're going to have to If you're an invertebrate, it means that you don't have a backbone. Here it is, here it is. My kid came on a field trip, and they said they wouldn't leave me alone. We had to come and see what this was about. You can do almost every kind of recreation. You can take nature hikes, you can do birding, boating, fishing, kayaking, canoeing. It's a learning-centered environment, and you cannot leave this place without taking something with you. There's what? The alligator. Where's the alligator? Over there. Yes, you teach the child, the child teaches the parent, and that is how you reach the next generation. Because when you reach the child, then they will grow up and teach their children. And that is really the only way that stewardship happens and how the green spaces are going to be conserved. The wide open coastal prairies of Texas are now as rare as a rainbow. No longer do huge flocks of geese and waterfowl fly overhead. Many are gone, as their precious wetlands are now suburbs. Almost extinct is the Atwater's prairie chicken. The booms of the bird drowned out as the prairie is plowed for people. Despite all that, there is a shift. Put a little bit more water in there. People yeah. are working to reverse the trend. That's one bucket worth. To resurrect this historic habitat that's on the brink. As this is the coastal prairie's last stand. What do we not want this to become? And the short answer is we don't want this to become a subdivision. Wes Newman works for the Katy Prairie Conservancy. They have one of the largest tracts of undeveloped coastal prairie left. Historically, the coastal prairie covered 9 million acres, extending along the coasts of Louisiana and Texas, and further inland some 75 miles. But Houston and other cities continue to expand and eat up more and more of the prairie landscape. Now less than a tenth of a percent of pristine coastal tall grass prairie remains. I mean, if you just don't say anything for a second, can you hear that? And you come out here and experience true quiet 
and true sounds of nature, um, that's an experience that's, that's hard to find these days. It's now winter on the Katy Prairie. We've got uh, perfect burning conditions today. <sighs> and to protect and restore this prairie, they're burning it. Right now, we're starting out, we're setting our back fires. When we're getting ready, get ready, because it's going to burn. Walk in the line. These 500 acres are overgrown with some nasty invasive trees and shrubs that crowd out the native grasses. What the woodies will eventually do is basically choke out the grass and take over. For quail or uh, ground nesting birds, neotropicals, that kind of thing, it's not necessarily the best habitat. There's no hurry, there's no danger, we just need it for safety. Pretty sizable chunk of land that uh, what vegetation is here. It's been in need of uh, some prescribed fire for quite a while. Hopefully this will be the first of many. Because we've taken fire out of the natural ecosystem, uh, that's part of the reason that this, these woody species have, have gotten such a hold. Four, I think we're in, in good shape. I think we got everything downwind uh, pretty well burned. I'm tired. It's been a long day. <laughs> and this will open it up, make some good, good quail habitat, good model duck habitat, good everything habitat. While this section of the Katy Prairie is in good hands, down in Laporte, there's a patch of prairie grass that needs some help. Okay, right here. Actually, maybe we should do it in three pieces. Yeah. Meet master naturalists Tom Solomon and Jim Duran. Wait a minute, that's one chunk, isn't it? Yeah. Consider these two prairie patriots. They are here to save some Texas coastal prairie plants. This is big blue stem is the main driver, what we're after. It's the rarest of the big blue stem, switchgrass, eastern gamma, yellow Indian, and little blue. This prairie field holds some of those rare grass species. Some spice wood. And it's soon going to be a parking lot. We were told it was going to be paved. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous loss, and we're going to try to save as much of it as we can. We're going to work our butt off to do that. Ready? We pulled out probably 100 yep. to 200 tubs of grass already. Let's go up. And we still have another 150 tubs to go here. I don't think that we'll ever get back to what we had 100 years ago. You know, the first thing that's got to happen is you've got to put the plants in the ground. Tom and his team worked to get more of those grasses in the ground by breaking apart these huge mounds of mixed up grasses. We use uh, saws, knives, anything whatsoever. What we're really basically going after is this right here. This is the big blue stem plant. You can tell that this is big blue stem right here by the purple reddish color at the base. After all the grass gets divvied up, hundreds of pots sit ready to be planted. But you can see that they are really doing super good. Those potted plants have helped restore prairies at state parks like Sheldon Lake, Brazos Bend, San Jacinto, and Galveston Island. And often the work's done thanks to the generation that has a chance to turn things around. Today we will have about 100 students. These sophomores and seniors from Chavez High School are here at Herman Park to do some prairie restoration. Anything that's marked with orange paint, okay. I want you to cut low down to the ground. So some of these are Chinese elm, they're an invasive plant. They were brought in with the nursery trade. They choke out the native plants. Oh, big ass trees. When we actually bring them to a natural setting or a park setting. Yeah. And we bring them to it with the intent of focusing on those plants rather than just throwing a Frisbee they begin to see that world differently and begin to hopefully value the natural world. Today we took down all the, well, how do you say it? Invasive species, the, the trees that weren't supposed to be there. And right now we're planting um, grasses that um, belong here. You're not allowed to tell them they're learning things because this is fun. Wait a second. Teamwork, ooh. 
This gives us the opportunity to actually get hands this on. This is where you got to push in the eye. I know, it's got to get the muddy on the Jordans. And I'm sorry, this is what biology is really about, getting dirty and get out in the world and seeing the actual plants and specimens growing and establishing habitat. Put my, my switchgrass plant in. Put a little bit more water in there. They actually learn to look. They learn to think about it. There you go. You begin to work on the stewardship of it, the whole value that makes them think, well, this is worth maintaining or restoring. Summertime is a great time to explore uh, the insect life on a prairie. Go for it, this is a good spot. And so we're out here using sweep nets to catch insects. Now he's struggling again. That's really the way that they start to get excited about a prairie. That's called a green lynx spider, showing them real living, breathing things and giving them real adventures is the way to capture their, their hearts as well as their minds. These are the future prairie patriots. For the coastal prairie, the kids of today will be the voice of prairie preservation tomorrow. It's important to get the kids out here because if they don't understand the system now, how can we expect them to buy off on protecting and preserving this in the future? Awesome. Did you see that? Did you see that? All right, you guys ready? The train's leaving the station. Let's go. This is their future. If they're going to, to be able to see tall grass prairies, then they have to be involved because otherwise it's going to all disappear. Oh, look at that. I see Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. They're like flying grease. I've always wondered what those were. All right, guys. When it's nesting time for birds along the Gulf Coast, it's time for humans to keep their distance and be careful not to disturb them. If you see a group of birds on an island in anywhere between, say, March and August, and they're acting kind of conspicuously, they're probably nesting. And if all of a sudden you see a whole bunch of birds getting up and flying off, then you've already, you've already gotten a little bit too close. This is a critical period in the life cycle of the birds. Without a safe place to nest, the overall population of coastal water birds will decline. When people get a little bit too close to nesting birds, that can have some pretty catastrophic effects on the nesting success of the birds. Getting too close can actually cause a panic reaction and scatter birds. When they move from the nest, they're actually leaving those eggs and chicks completely exposed. And when birds are chicks, they can't thermoregulate very well at all, so they rapidly overheat. And the eggs, of course, can't thermoregulate at all. In this hot Texas heat, in the middle of the nesting season, getting birds off of eggs and chicks for just a couple minutes can result in death or cooking of the egg. They say you can cook an egg on the sidewalk, basically cooking eggs on the islands. These rookery islands are easy to spot. Boaters and anglers need to be aware of their actions and yield plenty of space to birds. You want to make sure you give them a comfortable distance. Recognize that they're there. If birds are reacting to your presence, you're too close and you need to move back a little bit. The best advice I can give is to be aware of your surroundings, to take into account that wildlife is depending on these particular sites. They're basically there to raise a family. They're trying to accomplish raising young all the way up till those young can fledge. So they're vulnerable throughout that entire time.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels. Over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.